everyone. Good morning. Let us pray. O God of our salvation, who didst out of love send thine only begotten Son into the world, that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life, grant unto us the aid of the Holy Spirit, that we may be firmly assured of the mystery of grace, cleaving to it always in true faith, that we may be enabled uh, to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, and to follow after holiness in the fear of God, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, may be pressed toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, so order the course of thy providence toward us, that all things may work together for our good. Enable us, through the aid of thy Spirit, to use the means of salvation we enjoy in the church, that we may be delivered from the power of our sins, and may be strengthened with all might in the inner man unto every word and work. Make us equal to all duties and trials. Help us to overcome the world. Subdue Satan under our feet. Hold thou us up in our goings, and lead us by thy hand in the way in which we ought to walk, that we come not short of thy glory, and that no man take from us our crown. And finally, when we shall have thus endured to the end through the power of thy victorious grace, grant, O most merciful Father, that we may die in peace, and so enter ever the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we are on page 16 of our uh, apolo second century apologist readers. If you're joining us via uh, the recording here, uh, what we're doing is we're, uh, we're, we're actually finishing up the apologist today or in the next session. Uh, and if you'd like a copy of this reader, uh, this is something I put together. You can send me an email and I will send you an electronic copy of that. We're on page 16. And we are, I believe we're ready for number two. Uh, Dialogue with Trifo, chapter 10. And we just, briefly last time we, uh, we started with, uh, we, we had gone through the apologists and uh, seen a lot of the different, um, oh, what would you say, a lot of the different accusations that were leveled against Christians. And now in this final section that we move specifically into uh, justification by faith in at least the dialogue with Trifo. And we talked about the introductory material with that last time. So uh, would somebody, Aaron, would you read the first paragraph of that for us? And when they ceased, I again addressed them thus. Is there any other matter, my friends, in which we are blamed than this, that we live not after the law and are not circumcised in the flesh as your forefathers were and do not observe Sabbaths as you do? Are, are our lives and customs also slandered among you? And I ask this, have you also believed concerning us that we eat men and that after the feast, having extinguished the lights, we engage in promiscuous concubinage? Or do you condemn us in this alone, that we adhere to such tenets and believe in an opinion untrue as you think? All right, thank you. So, uh, so he, he's still addressing Trifo, obviously, this Jew. And uh, you know, we had just last time read chapter 8 where... Trifo marks out kind of the, the battle lines for here's where the argument's going to go, or here's where the, the dialogue, the conversation's going to go. And it's, uh, so Justin zeroes in on that in this paragraph. And he's asking rhetorically, what's your all's problem with us? And what's interesting here is he, he mentions, uh, he mentions, some of the things that we've been talking about, some of the themes that we've been talking about in previous weeks, as far as the uh, accusations that the pagans were making against Christians. So what does he say here? Um, have you also believed concerning us that we eat men? So that would be your accusation of cannibalism. Uh, let's see. They I mean, even say, um, not observe Sabbaths as you do. You think that we don't worship the true God. Right. Right. So, so you have two different you, you have two different things going on here, uh, and I think you're right to zero in on that first of all here because uh, it's a matter of Justin's asking him, is it is it just because we don't observe Sabbath, circumcision, uh, you know, festival days, uh, holiness regulations, all of these things from Mosaic law, or is it that we, we, we 
you know, we have all these pagan accusations against us, like cannibalism, uh, or that after the feast, having extinguished the lights, we engage in promiscuous concubinage. So, like we had talked about uh, in previous weeks with Anaphanagoras, he deals with that a lot, with those accusations of uh, incestuous relationships between Christians, or at least the accusation of uh, things of that nature then. So, you have two different things, or two different things happening here. You have the is it this? Is it the, the law, the Mosaic law stuff? Or is it the other accusations uh, that the pagans are making then? Uh, and what it comes down to then, you know, or do you condemn us for this alone, he says in that last sentence, that we adhere to such tenets and believe in an opinion untrue as you think. So this is then where the conversation is going to go. I'll read the next paragraph here. This is what we are amazed at, said Trifo. But those things about which the multitude speak are not worthy of belief, for they are most repugnant to human nature. Moreover, I am aware that your precepts in the so-called gospel are so wonderful and so great that I suspect no one can keep them, for I have carefully read them. But this is what uh, we are most at a loss about, that you, professing to be pious and supposing yourselves better than others, are not in any particular uh, separated from them. But do not all, and do not alter your mode of living from the nations, in that you observe no festivals uh, or Sabbaths, uh, and do not have the right of circumcision, and further resting your hopes on a man that was crucified, yet you expect to obtain some good thing from God, while you do not obey his commandments. Have you not read that the soul shall be cut off from his people, uh, who shall not have been circumcised on the eighth day? And this has been ordained for strangers and for slaves equally. But you, despising his covenant rashly, reject the consequent duties and attempt to persuade yourselves that you know God when, however, you perform none of those things which they do who fear God. If, therefore, you can defend yourself on these points and make it manifest in what way you hope for anything whatsoever, even though you do not observe the law, this we would very gladly hear from you, and we shall make other similar investigations. So, Trifo is a level-headed level-headed guy, as we've seen. And so he says right off the bat, you know, we're amazed at all that stuff, but, he says, those things which are, the multitudes speak of are not worthy of belief, for they are most repugnant to human nature. So Trifo immediately dismisses the, the cannibalism, uh, the promiscuous concubinage, and all the other things that the pagans ascribe to Christians simply because uh, misinformation. So all, all the slander and the calumny about Christians. So he, he backs away from all of that and says, you know, those things are repugnant to human nature, and uh, no one who claims to follow God can be engaged in those things. However, then he goes on to say, uh, he talks about the precepts in the so-called gospel, uh, and how they're so great that no one can keep them, which is kind of the point. Uh, but, then he says, this is what we are most at loss, that you professing to be pious and supposing yourselves better than others are not in any particular separated from them. So, if we think about the Old Testament, uh, part of the, or one of the points of the Mosaic Law, of the Levitical Law, cleanliness codes and these sorts of things, but what was part of the purpose for the Jews in relation to the other nations? Well, it, it, was, to, it was to separate them from the other nations. So, they were the only nation that circumcised their males on the eighth day. They were the only nation that, you know, didn't eat, uh, you know, certain food. You know, they had, they had their own foods they couldn't eat. So, you know, you know Texas barbecue was out. And, uh, you, know, you know, shrimp feast at Red Lobster Well, the whole point was, was to separate themselves to make them holy so that the Lord could dwell among them. Right. Right. And, and it said here, not alter your mode of living from the nations, mm -hmm. where obviously the Jews were very much... In everything they did was very opposite very different. of what all the other nations were doing. Right, right. In living, in worship, in laws, mm -hmm. in in all of that. Right, right. So, so Tri Trifo's point here at the very beginning then is that you profess to be pious, you profess to be God fearing, and you profess that uh, that all of the, this is the God of the Old Testament, etc., the God of the Jewish scriptures. But you completely forsake all of his actual commands. You say that you believe in him, but you get, don't do any of the things 
which he says then, uh, which he commands you to do. Uh, so yeah, like you said, you know, your mode of living from the nations is no different than the nations, meaning you live like Gentiles. And so this, uh, but this is a thing that we'll see a lot in Justin's dialogue with Trifo, or rather we won't see, but that you would see if you read it, is that uh, you know, it, it's not this very you know, Pauline Galatians course running through it where it's the whole question of, well, are you going to live like a Jew or are you going to live like a Gentile? And... Uh, I have a question. Yes, what's your question? Okay, because I missed a couple of weeks. Now, we are no longer talking, defending to the Romans or defending to the Jews now. Correct, yes. Okay. I got it. Okay, well, right, and I think we had mentioned this briefly last week. But it's worth, uh, it's worth mentioning again, this, the, the apologists, for the, most, for the most part, are defending against uh, the pagans. So, so the pagans are attacking them, and their accusations are things like we mentioned, um, cannibalism, um, you know, uh, what were some of the other ones? Uh, prostitution. Uh, I forget some of the other ones. Uh, uh, well, like, like um, incest. Incest, yeah. Just, just general fornication, and generally the nastier forms of fornication. Uh, exposure of infants was another one. And then, of course, the big one was then atheism. Yes. Which we talked about. Uh, whoops. There we go. Uh, which, when we talk about atheism, it's not like we talk about atheism today where it's, you know, you don't believe in any god. Because as we talked about, everyone believes in a god, even if that's just simply themselves. Uh, but in the ancient world, the charge of atheism was, you don't believe in our gods. You don't believe in the Roman pantheon, and therefore you are atheists. And, and, and like we mentioned uh, way back in the day, Christians weren't the only ones that were accused of being atheists. So, right, so on, on the one hand, probably... 95% of the apologists' writings are writing, defending against the pagan accusations uh, and trying to, you know, basically crying out, you know, this, these are fake news, these aren't real, and here's why. Uh, but when we get to the dialogue with Trifo, and as, to, to the best of my knowledge, right off the top of my head, this is the only of the second century apologists that really deals with the Jews. Uh, but with, with the dialogue with Trifo, then, you also have, then, uh, you, you're defending against the arguments uh, against, against the Christians from the Jews. And so you're going to have a very different starting point. One thing that you're not going to hear from Trifo is that he is, uh, you're not going to hear uh, that, oh, you know, Christians, all y'all are atheists or something like that. Because uh, you know, then there's the commonality of, well, we both confess that we're believing in the true God. Um, we're, we're, we're both using the Old Testament. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're familiar with the laws. We're familiar with uh, those sorts of things. So when you're dealing with the Jewish-Christian relations, then you have a whole kind of substructure uh, that you're, you're yeah. building upon. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's why at the very beginning of this, he says, you know, the, the stuff about which the multitudes speak uh, that's not worthy of belief. So he's, he's saying, I don't believe any of the pagan accusations against you all uh, because they're just repugnant to you know, just, just even natural law, let alone you know, trying to be God-fearing whatsoever. Uh, so in fact here, we can, all, we can start ticking some things off here on our list. Well, I think uh, uh, oh, just by way of kind of rounding that out, um, you, you mentioned last week that... We don't have we we don't know if this was an actual conversation or a literary construct. Right. Um, you said you thought probably actual. I, I tend to think actual, yeah. But really going, but but regardless, what they're trying to do is what do Christians do with the law, and then answering who is Israel, and mm -hmm. and then answering who is Messiah. I think those are the the key points that that these apologists are trying to deal with and answer. Right, right. Um, so, so Trifo here is then, and we, we've updated our board here, but so yeah, so Trifo's concerns with the Christians are really entirely different from the pagans. Uh, 
because again, like we said, you have this entire substructure where uh, you have much more in common between the Jews and the Christians as far as the Old Testament goes. So his big things are going to be, you know, why don't you circumcise your kids? Uh, his things are going to be, you know, why do you, you know, eat what you eat? Why, why do you live like the Gentiles, uh, the nations, as, as this translation has? You know, uh, we, we get to the top of the next page, page 17, uh, or the sentence, it's in the middle of the sentence. Resting your hopes, resting your hopes on a man that was crucified. So we've mentioned this several times over. Uh, you know, crucifixion is the most shameful death that you can have in the ancient world. And uh, so his point is simply, you put your faith in, in a man who was put to most shameful death, um, and you expect to obtain a good thing from God while you do not obey his commandments. So that's then the final one there is, y'all thumb your nose at God's commandments. And, and when he says that, he doesn't mean the Ten Commandments as an encapsulation of moral law. He means you know, everything that's there in the Old Testament. Um, so this is really then the... Or the these are going to be the things that we see throughout this. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. Trifo is Jewish. Correct, yes, Trifo is a Jew. Correct. Yeah, between him and the Christians, right. Okay. Right, so... Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well but no, that's a good point, though. Uh, that, that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up, because, right, so everything that we've read up until these last two readings... Uh, have been directed towards the pagans. So that's where you had uh, Anath Anathanagoras' uh, things to um, the emperor, uh, or you, you know, to Hadrian, to Antonius Pius, however. however. Uh, you also had Aristides, the philosopher. Uh, who else? We, we read a little bit of Tertullian, uh, who was writing much later. Um, let's see. And, we, and, and Justin, of course. Uh, but right, so. With this, then, we've pivoted from looking at the, you know, defending against pagan accusations, we've pivoted to defending against the Jewish acts, accusations, then. Uh, well, and, and this goes to show, I think, too, uh, you had, much like you have today, you have Christians defending the faith. It, it, it's a multiple front war. Because Christians today, uh, you know, the true church, is defending the faith on the one side against the world, so you got against paganism on the one side, uh, and it's very, very weird accusations. On the other side, uh, you have false religions that we are you know, defending ourselves against. Uh, and, and then too, I think if you pivot back to the world, it's not really a third option, it's more of like a subset of the, the whole paganism thing, is you have Christians have to push back against the false church as well, because the world and the false church, they're, they're allies in this too. So, right, just like we had to fight a multiple front war, so do, you know, so did they back in the early, back in the second century, first and second, even in the third. I think we mentioned this last week, uh, this whole, kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, if we want to call it a dialogue with the Jews, this is something that continues in Christian history, you know, even up to this day. It looks much different after World War II because of things that were done. But the dialogue with the Jews still goes on. One thing that we'll notice, um, once we finish with uh, Justin here, once we finish with the dialogue with Trifo and the apologists, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to read the seven epistles of Ignatius of Antioch. And uh, Ignatius is writing, oh, I'm, I'm going to say about 107, 108 A.D., and uh, Ignatius is not writing as an apologist, he's writing as a bishop in the church. Uh, so he's writing to the faithful for the sake of the faithful. And uh, Ignatius will take a much different approach to the Jewish problem um, than Justin does. And that's because there's a different context, and it's also because Ignatius isn't trying to proselytize Trifo the Jew here and his companions. He's trying to defend 
the flocks from Christians who want to be more like the Jews, which we'll actually interact with, I believe, here in chapter 92 or chapter, well, in one of the readings here next, we'll interact with something like that. But does that make any more, any more sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, that's good. That's good. <laughs> right, right. Like last time I was in class, we were talking about one thing, and now we're talking about something completely different. Okay. Well, and I think uh, what Aaron said too there um, helps. Then I think we wrote this on the board last time. You had the three main things, which were uh, you, know, you, you, you can see this in these accusations. Is you have. You know, the, the main concern is the law, and then we'll throw in the commandments there as well. Um, and then the other one is Messiah, here with the faith. But you also then have the, uh, the third, what was the third one we said? Uh, oh, Israel. Israel. Yeah, so you have the question of, you know, uh, running out of board space here. You have the question is, of, of, of who is the true Israel? And what we see then is, um, if, we took a, if we took a more expansive view of church history, uh, even up to modern times, really, what you'll see is these three issues are the three issues that keep coming back over and over and over again in the dialogue between Christians and Jews. It's what do you do with the law, who's the Messiah, and who is actually Israel? And I think we still, or with the Jews today, even, we still, mm -hmm. we still Right. Try to help them see the Christian point of view on those things. Right, right. Well, and I think we could take a step back even further, uh, because like we mentioned last week, last week, Justin never quotes Paul, because what good would it do? Uh, Trifo doesn't think St. Paul is any kind of an authority, so it would do no good. Uh, but what we see throughout the dialogue with Trifo is uh, Paul's arguments in Galatians and Romans are this golden thread woven through the entire thing. In fact, we'll read a couple selections where he's almost quoting Paul verbatim, and uh, or he's putting Paul in his own words, or using the exact same uh, doctrine, like in Galatians especially. But it's so so it starts even with Paul himself of you know what's the actual purpose of the law in Galatians chapter three, uh, two and three, uh, and then it's the whole question you know of, of, of who's the Messiah. But, and Paul even deals with this in a little bit in Galatians, but also in Romans, of you know, the true Israel of God. You know, when he says in Romans chapter 9, not all of Israel uh, were Israel. Meaning, even in the Old Testament, the true Israel was always those who had faith in the coming Messiah, not those who were born of Abraham. Then. So you can, be, you can be in Israel, but not of Israel, or numbered among Israel, but not actually. Now think about uh, John chapter 1. Where Jesus says uh, to Nathaniel, you know, a true Israelite in whom there is no guile. Okay. Let's see. So we're on the top of page 17 here. Again, uh, th this is really it. Uh, but you, despising this covenant rashly, reject the consequent duties and attempt to persuade yourselves that you know God, when, however, you perform none of those things which they do who fear God. So again, the, the, this, this chief sticking point for Trifo is you say you want to follow God, you say you love God, but you refuse to do the things that he commands. So for, for right now, the big thing is the law. You don't do circumcision, you don't do the law, you don't and, do his commandments. And those are specifically the Levitical. Right, because as we've seen Because in, the Christians, we do follow the Ten Commandments. Absolutely, right. But... but the more specific Levitical laws. Right. Yeah. So, so we don't circumcise our circumcision. <laughs> we don't circumcision our kids. We don't circumcise our boys for religious purposes. Right. Uh, you know, we, uh, we 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 don't. It's not required upon Christians that we you know avoid shellfish and. We don't do all the cleanliness laws. Right. Those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so, or he mentions, I think, it's on the bottom of page 16, and he mentions uh, festivals as well. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you observe no festivals or Sabbaths. 
which, which is a great uh, zinger against uh, like your Sabbatarians uh, today. Uh, you know, basically, your, your Seventh-day Adventists and your um, Sabbatarian Baptists, you know, they're, they're the same thing. But, uh, you know, Christians today who are Judaizing and saying, well, yeah, the, it's, the commandment says you have to worship on the Sabbath, therefore Christians have to worship on the Sabbath. It's like, well, okay, did, you know, Galatians and you know, Colossians chapter 2 fall out of your Bible or something? Um, because, and then again, looking at church history, it's, look, Justin's writing in 150, 155 AD, so he's, this is a very early attestation to the fact of Christians just don't worship on the Sabbath. They don't follow Passover and Tabernacles and Purim and you know, Hanukkah and whatever like that. Uh, and again, when we put that with what we'll read in Ignatius next, uh, it's very clear that from the outset, the Pauline idea of you know, these things were simply shadows of the reality to come in Christ. And that's, uh, what is it, Colossians 2, 16 and 17, I think? Yeah, and, and he'll, he'll use that sort of language. Right. Right. Well, okay, yeah, yeah. So let's go, um, if you've got your Bibles in front of you, let's go to Colossians 2 and look at this. Uh, just by way of... Hold on a minute. See on the deal. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to send you a picture? No, it's right now. Okay. Who, who, who comes to Bible class remotely and doesn't have their Bible? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Hold on, hold on. No, go ahead. We'll, yeah, we'll give you time here. Okay, so starting at verse 16. So let no one judge you in food or drink. Or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or Sabbaths, uh, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So we have a couple different things going on here. Uh, the, the, the chief point here is uh, uh, the, the substance of the reality versus the shadow of it. Um, and so Paul's point is that all these things in the Old Testament... Uh, all of them are types of Christ, uh, the ministry, the church, the sacraments, etc. Uh, things that we see, the reality of them in the New Testament. And uh, so therefore, once the reality has come, the shadow fades away. Yeah? Here, here's from Hebrews 10. It's oh, yeah. like a footnote. Okay. Hebrews 10.1. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. Right. Yeah, that's a great point in Hebrews 10, 1, so, and the rest of the chapter, in that uh, those sacrifices have to be continually done on a regular basis. Whereas you have Christ's once-for-all sacrifice. Uh, there was an article I read years ago in some journal about well, and I think, so, okay, let's just see if I'm thinking of this yeah, correctly, yeah, what, what we're with. saying. So, especially when you're talking about, you know, Levitical laws such as mm -hmm. sacrifices mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the cleansing and the dietary re re regulations and all that. Simply go going back to what we were saying, you're doing these things, the Jews were doing these things specifically to separate themselves from their neighbors to make themselves holy. But Christ came, fulfilled all of those, and then was the sacrifice mm -hmm. once for all. And as Christians, we no longer have to abide by the dietary regulations and the sacrifices and all of that because Christ has not only fulfilled them, but then given that 
to us. We are now clothed in Christ, um, cleansed in our baptisms, um, and we don't need to keep re-sacrificing because that has already been taken care of right. once for all, um, no mm -hmm. longer needed. We are now holy and separated because we are in Christ. Right. Well, and, and then to throw another monkey wrench in this, um, the sacrifices at this point, so Justin's writing this, like we said, about 150, 155 A.D. What had happened back in 70 A.D.? Uh, we are in Colossians 2. 2, two verse 16. Colossians 2, 16. In 70 A.D., Vespasian and then Titus came in and bad cleanup, uh, you know, the temple was destroyed. And it was never to be rebuilt. Uh, and then in, I believe it was 135, you had the Bar Kokhba revolt, uh, and you had Jews expelled again. Uh, but, but the point is that by this point, sacrifices in Jerusalem had stopped. So uh, and that's, that's why in this you don't see... Uh, you don't see Trifo talking about the sacrifices at all because the sacrifices had ceased. You'd think that'd be like a huge thing that a they would try thing. to continue. I mean, that was like the point of right. Well, but hey, right, exactly all of it. Except they weren't allowed, according to the law, to sacrifice just wherever they wanted to. Right, right. They had to sacrifice in the place where God put His name, and God put His name in Jerusalem. Here was the tabernacle. Here was the temple. Temples mm -hmm. no more. Mm -hmm. You have a couple instances of prophets building altars like Elijah in uh, 1 Kings 18 that aren't there, but that's a different situation. That's a you know, kind of a, like we said before, that's the, the first ecumenical service. <laughs> so, yeah, go ahead. What do modern Jews think of still be sacrificing? What are they sacrificing? Well, okay, so this is interesting. Um, uh, she asked about modern Jews. Uh, for the most part, there is nothing to sacrifice. Uh, I, years ago, and, and if, if Wayne was here, he could tell us more about this. I know up in um, up in New York, where he lived, uh, and I've read about this before. You have, oh, you have the sacrifice of chickens and things like this in like the Crown Heights neighborhood and whatnot. Uh, I, I've read, I, I read a chapter in a book about this years ago, and it was very modern supper. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. <laughs> Uh, but but really, no, the, the sacrifices ha have stopped entirely. And this is something that goes back to, um, well, two things about that. That, that point right there, the sacrifices ceased and have never been restored, has been a common Christian talking point, point since the early church. Now, I don't recall if Justin gets into that point in the dialogue with Trifo. Or not, but I know when you get into the next century, and especially by the time you get to Athanasius and Cyril of Alexandria, that's a point that they hammer home a lot. And uh, but but anyway, you see that point. You even see Luther talk about that in his writings um, about the, or, or when he's writing to the Jews. And one of the arguments against Judaism is your sacrifices have stopped, and they've been stopped for. You know, in Luther's case, it was fifteen hundred years. Uh, in our case, it's you know, two millennia. So that's one of those things of you, you can't even do your own law because you can't be doing this. Uh, but back in the first century, when you saw, uh, you know, where, where does Jesus always go to teach? You know, I shouldn't say always, but where does he sometimes go to teach? He goes to the synagogues. Where did Paul and Barnabas go to teach in the missionary journeys? To synagogues first until they were, <laughs> until they were run out on a rail. Uh, but so you had within the dispersion all, all over all over the, the known world, uh, even from here you had the synagogues, and that was where worship primarily happened. So um, as the Jews dispersed and were dispersed, you couldn't be always sacrificing in Jerusalem. So uh, the, the more the Jews spread out, the more Judaism became about synagogue worship, reading the scriptures, memorizing the scriptures, uh, and living, you know, doing the circumcision, the regulations, and, and festivals insofar as they could then. Mm -hmm. So sacrifice uh, was already, you know, for, for Jews out in the dispersion, that was something that you came to Jerusalem for Passover, and you did that. That's why, you know, there were animals in the temple courts for uh, for Passover for purchase, right? Because you're not going to bring Betsy the ox. Well, Betsy wouldn't be an ox named 
Uh, <laughs> but you wouldn't take them you all that way. as an ox or something like that. Uh, but, but right, right, you wouldn't haul that all the way. So, uh, or I guess you could, but you know, that would be foolish, I would think. So, right, so, so there's all these different things going on with the sacrifices. Uh, but so for the Jews, and, and he says, Justin even says at one point, uh, that Trypho had lived in Jerusalem um, and then uh, in its environs, but then um, after, the, after the Jews were expelled from Judea again, after the Bar Kokhba revolt, then he had to, he basically moved to Rome. because there's a huge population. Um, at one point, there were more Jews in Alexandria, Egypt, or in Rome than there were in Judea. So yeah, absolutely, it, it would have been devastating. Uh, but what's in, like, like I've said, and I think we mentioned this last week too, what's really interesting about these things and the, and the arguments that Justin lays down is that Justin, you, you can see this, law, Messiah, and who is Israel, those are still the questions, those are still kind of the, 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 the points of contact between Jews and Christians, today, or at least they should be. Uh, until the ecumenical movement came in and, you know, Zionism and those sorts of things, those were the three talking points. They still need to be the three talking points, uh, or the, the chief parts of that. Now, now, you mentioned, like, the Decalogue. Now, of course, the Christians follow that because uh, the, the Ten Commandments, because the Ten Commandments are an encapsulation of the moral law. Uh, so the moral law we still follow, uh, but, you know, this is, so this is where we divide it up into... Um, Old Testament laws are moral, ceremonial, or civil. So the civil laws are shot because Israel is no longer a state, uh, an Old Testament theocracy. Uh, the ceremonial laws are shot because they pointed, they, they separated Israel uh, so that it could be an incubator for Christ, for the Messiah. Well, the Messiah has come, so those laws are gone. That's Paul's point in Galatians and Romans. Uh, and so that leaves us with the moral law, which applies to all people of all times, from the beginning. It's like why Cain didn't have to be told, thou shalt not murder. It's like, you know that was wrong. Why'd you do that? Well, and even when people are, you know, in scripture, when they're trying to entrap Jesus, they're like, what's the greatest law? Mm -hmm. And he essentially... Yeah, he always he, distills, he it distills it down. He distills it down to the first tablet and the second commandment. Mm -hmm. And uh, or the first table and the second table. Right. He distills it down and... Lays it out. I mean, oh, over and over. Mm -hmm. So not saying, okay, we're throwing those out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What is the, what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Which is yeah, commandments one through three and commandments four through ten. Right. That's the law. Mm -hmm. Right. Or even like um, Paul in Romans, what is it, thirteen, where he says, "Love is the fulfillment of the law." Mm -hmm. Before he gets to that point, he's saying things like, "You know, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, etc." All these are fulfilled in this one word, which is love. Love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, how much time do we have? 20 minutes. Okay. Let's move on to chapter 23. So, Dialogue with Trifo, chapter 23. We're on page 17 of our reader. And let's see here. But if we do not admit this, we shall be liable to fall into foolish opinions, as if it were not the same God who existed in the times of Enoch, and all the rest. This is Justin speaking, by the way. Who neither were circumcised after the flesh, nor observed Sabbaths, nor other rites, seeing that Moses enjoined at such observances, where the God has not wished each race of mankind continually to perform the same righteous actions, to admit which seems to be ridiculous and absurd. Therefore we must confess that he, who is ever the same, has commanded these and such like institutions on account of sinful men, and we must declare him to be benevolent, foreknowing, needing nothing, righteous, and good. But if this be not so, tell me, sir, what do you think of those matters which we are investigating? And when no one responded, wherefore, Trypho, I proclaim to you and to those who wish to become proselytes uh, the divine message which I heard from that man, uh, the man who converted Justin. Do you see that the elements are not idle and keep no Sabbaths? Remain as you were born, 
For if there was no need of circumcision before Abraham, or of the observance of the Sabbaths, or feasts or sacrifices before Moses, no more need is there of them now. After that, according to the will of God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has been born without sin, of a virgin sprung from the stock of Abraham. For when Abraham himself was in uncircumcision, he was justified and blessed by reason of the faith which he reposed in God, as the scripture tells. Let's, let's stop there for just a moment. Because this is, this is a big argument. And, and, and a big point that, again, we'll see, uh, again, throughout the early church, uh, all the way up into, um, like, uh, Epiphanius writing in his um, uh, catalog of heresies when he starts dealing with the Jews in Book 1. This is, this is his big point. And so Justin's have laying the groundwork for this now. And who wasn't circumcised? Abraham. Abraham. Well, now, eventually he was, right? Eventually he was. But um, he was justified before. Right, he, he was, was justified, justified before. On account of his faith, as Scripture tells us. Right, okay, so there's a couple things going on here. First of all, we see, we hear the echo of St. Paul. Uh, this is Galatians chapter 3. You know, the law came... 430 years after Abraham, or even when he's talking about circumcision, it's very clear, Paul, Paul even quotes, uh, what he's alluding to is that to Genesis, what is it, 15, 6, and Abraham believed God, and it was imputed or credited to him as righteousness. So you have that idea. But go back even to, to the uh, first sentence of this. But if we admit this, we shall be liable to fall into foolish opinions as if it were not the same God who existed in the times of... Enoch. So Enoch is before or after the flood? Before. Yeah, so he's so he so this is a big point is was Enoch circumcised? No. No. Was Enoch, did they not follow the Sabbath? No. Festivals? No. Because all these things came through Moses, not from the beginning then. So his entire point is. All of the antediluvian fathers, all the pre-flood fathers, none of them were circumcised or followed Sabbath or any of that because those things had not been commanded yet. Whereas, you know, they, they didn't come in, or they only came in through Moses. And yet were, you know, Enoch and Methuselah and Jared and, you know, all those guys, were they all saved? Well, yeah, of course. And his point is, by pointing to Abraham and his justification by faith, apart from circumcision, therefore he uses that as the lens to look back into history prior to Abraham to say, as Abraham was justified by faith, so all of the pre-flood fathers were justified by faith. You know, this is Luther's big point in his uh, Genesis lectures. Again, that's the golden thread that runs <coughs> through the entirety of... Uh, the book of Genesis is how are people saved in the book of Genesis starting with Adam and Eve? Well, it's by faith in the promised seed, faith in the promised Messiah. Then. Uh, and so that's how they would have been justified and saved. That's how Enoch was justified. You know, Enoch walked with God and then was not. Uh, so you know, not because he followed these works, uh, but because he trusted the promised seed. Uh, let's see. So we read there towards the end, uh, in, in the middle of it, actually. If there was no need of circumcision before Abraham or the observance of Sabbaths uh, and feasts and sacrifices before Moses, uh, no more need is of them now. After that, according to the will of God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has been born without sin of a virgin sprung from the stock of Abraham. Uh, and then your point there that you made, for when Abraham himself was in uncircumcision, he was justified and blessed by reason of the faith which he reposed in God, as Scripture tells. So, it's a, it's a movement of prior to the law, everyone was justified. Even prior to Abraham, with the giving of circumcision in Genesis 17, everyone was justified by faith in the Messiah, mm -hmm. who was to come. Now that the Messiah... Okay, so you have that. Then you have the giving of the law. And again, this goes back to Galatians 3 with the point of, Paul's point of, well, what's the purpose of the law? Well, it's to encase everything in sin. So that people understand why they need the Messiah. The Messiah comes, fulfills the law, and so now, then, the law is not, no longer you know, binding upon people. 
what's binding upon people is what was binding upon people in the beginning, which is you live according to the will of God, moral law. Moral law. Yeah, moral law. And uh, you trust in the promised Messiah. Not as the one who is to come, but as the one who has come and who will come again. And so you see then how this works then with the Jews of this, how, how the law ties in with the second point of who the Messiah is. It's at one point he'll even tell Trifo, he's like, the one that you're still looking for, in fact, that may have been last week, uh, the one that you're still looking for. Uh, no, that was not last week. That's to come, I think, here in the next chapter or next week. Uh, the one that you're still looking for has already come, which again is a great point of contact for uh, interacting with Jews today. It's, you know, again, it's what do we do with the law? And the law leads us then to the Messiah, Galatians chapter 3. So let's keep going here. Moreover, the scriptures and the facts themselves compel us to admit that he, Abraham, received circumcision for a sign and not for righteousness. So that it was justly recorded concerning the people that the soul which shall not be circumcised on the eighth day shall be cut off from his family. And furthermore, okay, but well let's stop here and, and walk this point out. What does it mean that it was a sign and not for righteousness? Let's go to it Romans. Was, it was oh, simply a sealing of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Right. Right. Let's go to... Oh, Romans 4. And this is where he's talking about um, Abraham receiving circumcision. If we look at verse 11, Romans 4, 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of of the righteousness of faith, which he had, meaning the righteousness of faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of those who believe, though they are uncircumcised. So even for Abraham, circumcision didn't accomplish righteousness. It wasn't for righteousness, to gain righteousness. It was a seal or a sign that he was already righteous by faith previously to this. So here's another instance where we see Justin adopting the Pauline language without actually ever quoting Paul. Uh, but right, so, so, he, so he's saying, first of all, with, this, with the law, with circumcision, it's a matter of, it's not for righteousness, it's a seal that people are already righteous. It's like, like you said, that they're brought into the covenant. Yeah. Because it says, uh, Abraham believed God with the power of him for righteousness. Bingo. Right, right, right. And, and as we say every time we talk about this, just from a chronological point of view, that happens in Genesis 15. Circumcision isn't given until Genesis 17. And that's part of Paul's point in all of this is he was justified, he was, he was declared righteous before circumcision was ever given. And that's Trifo's, or not Trifo's point, that's Justin's point, uh, is as it was for Abraham who received circumcision, so it was for everybody else before that. Let's keep going here with uh, Justin. Because he'll make another point often. Uh, well, okay, so he explains that's why the, the commandment says, whoever is not circumcised shall be cut off. That had been something that Trifo had brought up uh, there in uh, chapter 10 that we had just read. And furthermore, the inability of the female sex to receive fleshly circumcision proves that this circumcision has been given for a sign and not for a work of righteousness. For God has given likewise to woman the ability to observe all things which are righteous and virtuous, but we see that the bodily form of the male has been made different from the bodily form of the female. Yet we know that neither of them is righteous or unrighteous merely for this cause, but is considered or imputed righteous by reason of piety and righteousness. So he points to the, uh, the inability of, of the female sex to receive circumcision. You know, they, can't be, they can't receive circumcision on their foreskin because... Well, we don't need to go into that. But, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, this is a biology class. Yeah. <laughs> if you need to, then uh, we'll give you a different book. But, uh, but th this is a common question that we get is, well, if circumcision 
know, brought people into the covenant, why was it forbidden to females? Or, you know, why, were, why were women excluded in the Old Testament? And, and this is the point. It's because, well, that was a sign of the covenant, but they, they were righteous by faith. Yeah, we're just better. You're just better. <laughs> we have the ability. Take it up with Eve. <laughs> yeah. They have the ability to observe all things which are righteous and virtuous. Um, mm -hmm. They're considered or imputed righteous by reason of piety and righteousness. Going back to the same right. thing you said, what do they do? Uh, with the help of God, live by the will of God, moral law, mm -hmm. and have faith in the Messiah who has come and who will come again. Right. Exactly. Same for both men and for women. Right. Right. This is like where St. Paul says in... Um, Oh, one of the Timothys, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Uh, you know, women will be saved through childbirth as long as they continue in faith and piety and righteousness and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, but, but, but Justin here uses that whole, you know, uh, the inability of women to be circumcised to show its true nature that it's not confirming or it's, it's not conveying or bestowing righteousness, uh, that it's simply a sign of the righteousness of faith, and, and there's a little bit more to it than that, but that's a different Bible study. Um, but we see then how Justin you know, brings up a common concern about Old Testament circumcision, uh, because then when you go into the New Testament, what's the New Testament equivalent, for a lack of a better term, for circumcision? And it's baptism, Paul says in Colossians 2. It's, it's the circumcision made without hands. And so, uh, you know, is and baptism is better than circumcision because then it's applied to men, you know, to males and to females then. Okay, we've got just a couple minutes left here before we uh, end up. Any questions or comments before we wrap up for the day? I think we'll stop here. Uh, we'll read chapter 92 and 47 next time. We're jumping around, but that's because we're trying to you know, make these certain points here. Love. We're, uh, we're going we're gonna to wrap up for the day, uh, but next time we'll start at the very bottom of page 17, very top of page 18 in the reader. So. Okay. Well, if no one has any questions, um, I think we will wrap up, and then we will head over to the sanctuary for matins. So thank you all for joining us uh, via the recording, and let's close in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we ask of your abundant mercy uh, that you would have mercy upon us poor sinners, that you would protect us, uh, both of body and of soul, that you would uh, keep us healthy in these days of uh, the, the distress of the pandemic, but also that you would keep us ever mindful that you give us our daily bread, and that every breath that we take in this life is a gift from you. You know all of our days, uh, and they are numbered in your book. We pray, Lord, that we would trust you in this always, that we would look to you as the giver of every good thing, and we pray that you would strengthen us in this faith now uh, through your holy word, which we are about to hear. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. How Thanks for joining us, Candace. How did it work?